Hi there, I'm Simon Bridges at the Auckland Business Chamber and it's great to be back for another Business Insights webinar. And today uh, we're really delighted to have with us Peter Torrington uh, of Ask Pete. Uh, Pete's got a great experience around multinational business and commercialisation and now he's giving back uh, to SMEs uh, in New Zealand with, with great go-to-market uh, strategies and, and advice. And today, Pete, I think you're going to talk to us about commercialisation with confidence. And uh, we really look forward to hearing about that. And uh, and then obviously, I'll probably ask you a few dumb questions uh, at the end of all of that. Look, look great, Simon. Great to, uh, to be able to share today and, uh, and join everybody. Okay, yeah, so as, as, as Simon said, I'm going to talk about commercialization with confidence. And that's today, I want to share some learning strategies and tools uh, to help businesses drive their commercial success. I'm going to break the presentation in sort of two sections. So one's really, again, uh, with my many, quite a few grey hairs and experience, some of my learnings and watchouts as I've worked uh, internationally and locally. And then I'm also going to share some thoughts on on the on commercialization approach, especially some simple tools and processes you can use. So the first thing I want to talk about today is differentiation and how that can give you control. And why is it important? Well, it's important because, again, you will have much more control. And control in areas such as pricing, when you're differentiated, you can, you can command a different price. When you're dealing with partners, whether it be retailers or distributors, if you're differentiated, you're going to be in a stronger position. That also plays to negotiations in areas such as innovation. And you want to be really clear on how you're differentiated and how this uh, resonates with your user base, and I'll talk about user base as much more as we go through. And ideally, you've got this with a moat. And what we mean, what I mean by that is, the moat makes it hard to copy, or someone to hard to copy you quickly, because then you're going to have differentiation for some time. I'll share today just some examples of differentiation to bring it to life. Uh, this one is what I was personally involved, which was the Colgate ActiBrush launch way back in 1999. I launched this in the UK. And that look that really changed the game. There was nothing like that before. So it's a true segment uh, differentiation with new technology. Another one I was involved in was a foaming hand soap. So yes, there was hand soap, but it, we wanted to sort of change the game again. So that gave stronger differentiation. Uh, some guys have, have been working with the Bostock brothers. And what they've done, which is a fabulous story, is they're New Zealand's only organic uh, chicken. And by developing that growing production approach, they really have developed an incredible brand. And to the point on a moat, it's really hard to copy because the setup to do that organically is really difficult. So that's been a great example of doing something clearly differentiated. A simple one is maybe a charity link. And this example on the screen is from Thank You, uh, which is just a, a product um, where, where an amount is given to charity for each purchase, but again, differentiates it from other personal care products. A few more to run through. So, look, um, in terms of silver and farms, they're talking about differentiating on sustainability. Uh, Gourmet, which is a pet treat brand that's based out of the South Island, are doing some neat stuff with mussels out of New Zealand. So, you've got an ingredient that's quite different. And then again, this has been copied to some degree, but in terms of, you know, say, we're always looking to have an added value service of a pickup, which can, again can make them different. And lastly, I've just mentioned Mikey Ape here, and then they've been very high in customer experience uh, feedback surveys in terms of what they're doing. So you may be able to give an incredible customer experience. But look, that's it, with a lot of New Zealand businesses, I think being really clear about differentiation and then talking about, you know, hygiene factors versus what is truly differentiation. So if something's a hygiene factor, that's kind of just what's expected or green fees for the category. So sort of basic things you've got to be doing. Yes, you've got to have those. But really importantly is what is different about your offer and how can this be sustained? And you want that to be meaningful. So look, just really thinking about that and being very clear about that is a great start for any business commercially. The second area I wanted to talk about uh, today is, is channel strategy and essentially where you're going to sell. And that's important, you know, for your success today in your business and really important for tomorrow as well, thinking through that really clearly. 
And look, what I've sort of captured here is, you know, when you're building your channel strategy, what is your core that will build a stronger tomorrow? And what I mean by that is, where are you going to be strong that you can then expand and then you know, get that business growth that you're looking for? And I've sort of captured some building blocks here, but where you're starting or, you know, if you're sort of early in, in the business, you want to be where your target audience is. So where are they buying or where are they shopping or where are they, you know, where are they looking for, for things? You want to have set your pricing that you want to build going forward. So if that's premium pricing, that has implications or value pricing, but really where are you going to establish that pricing as you go forward? You know, where are you going to build awareness? You know, making sure you can provide the service and support. There's nothing worse than you, sell a product or a service and it's going to fall over, you're not going to be expanding. So make sure you you do that with the right service and support. Um, look at a couple other areas there. So one's credibility. You know, if you're looking to especially, you know, develop something that, you know, needs credibility, you've got to be in the right sort of environment for that. And as all businesses need money, you want <laughs> people that are going to pay you and you're going to get a cash flow. So look, all of those things are incredibly important. And look, what I just... To hear it because I think you you know a lot of businesses will be doing things already, but I think an important thing is you can still change what you're doing. Actually, I was talking to a client recently and they felt that they had gone slightly wrong and uh, where they'd made themselves available, what they were doing. And it's so actually being comfortable to change that and maybe stop even supplying some some channels of partners is important. And then look, just to bring this to life, I've got just a couple of slides to again just show examples of this that usually find that that really helps. So the first one is um, just a, it's a Hills a premium pet food uh, brand uh, you know, available internationally. But what they've done there, which is interesting, is really focused purely on vet clinics and pet stores. And you know, what that does then is it, it really helps with their product. It's a premium product. They get engaged donors. The vets and the pet stores can give advice. It gives credibility. And it really helps that premium pricing. So there's no interest from that brand to say go to supermarkets where the pricing is potentially going to come lower and have issues versus those other channels. Uh, one you're probably not aware of, this is actually a, a local New Zealand business called um, M2 Overland. And the relatives will be new, but they're doing specialist ute fit out. So for sort of trading or camping, you can get the extra equipment on the ute. And what they've focused there is either doing it directly themselves or agents and because it's a tailored service and they, they they want advice and to give the support that really makes sense for them. So again, horses for courses and jumping to book a service, that's something quite different again than say two degrees is look, then you need to make sure that you've kind of got the stores uh, and the outlets that you need to be. And that can be from their own stores, which obviously got to sort of more special central stores. But then if you want, Top up cards or the guys are turning up to the airport, you need to be available there as well. So just really thinking through that and what's your rationale to be in the places. And look, with, without sort of over eating it too much, just one other example in this space, because it's kind of interesting, is I've worked on a toothpaste brand in Europe uh, called Almex, and their strategy was over time to build the credibility and, and, and sort of offer as they went forward, so they started with their technology with universities, then went to dentists and pharmacies and supermarkets. And then what they were allowed to do is each stage they had really strong support and kept the pricing and loyalty. So that's one of the most, it's a German-based brand and that's one of the most loyal brands by just taking the time and thinking that through uh, sequentially. So again, being very clear about your channel strategy and why and taking corrections if you need to uh, is important. Uh, next area I wanted to cover is just the customer partner lens. And actually, I was at a, um, a chatting to some people at NCT yesterday and sort of mentioned this. And I think we're all guilty of sort of not really thinking through the, the customer or partner side of things as much as we should. We're busy selling our own thing, but what does it mean for them? And so some key criteria that, you know, a distributor or a retailer is going to look at are, are these. So first of all, are you going to help grow revenue and margin? And margin means margin dollars, but also percent. So a lot of the you know bigger retailers they'll have sort of goals for both of those things, and you measure it against them. So you need to be accretive or stronger uh, to their current business. You know, are you meeting a key trend? So are you on you know if it's sustainability or different things? Are you sort of meeting that trend? Or are you behind the curve? Are you helping them meet some of those needs, and they can see the growth? 
you know, are you giving them differentiation versus other players? So this is their lens of differentiation. So are you going to be exclusive to me as a brand? That's exciting because I'm differentiating versus the other guy. Are you going to give me a different looking pack? So the pack you might do in a Costco's might be different to a Faro or whatever. So kind of what are you doing on that basis? You know, are you going to give me specific offers? You know, are you going to give me marketing support? And again, you know, with the big retailers, that could be their own activities they've got or what are you doing to spend money to make sure that customers are going to come in? You know, have you got the right product support? If it's something more technical, can they get the support that's required? And the glories of terms often means payment terms. So, you know, how, how attractive or not are you going to be? So look, just some simple guidance there of, you need to have this sort of lens because this is you want that to be attractive to the partner to make sense. Uh, the next one might get a bit of a smile, so selling is easy, and then they've made the point, not really. Again, it's hard, and again, with some of these big, uh, big, bigger retailers or players, it can be very difficult. So that isn't easy, and there's lots of heartache to get to there. But the point really I wanted to say is it's just the start. So getting in somewhere you know, again, a, a store or a wholesaler or whatever is really just the start. And that, if you don't do that well, that might be your only sale because you haven't really got the sell through. So what are you going to do to make sure it sells? And I've had some experiences myself where I've maybe sold it into the wrong channel or I haven't had the right activity. And then the thing doesn't sell. And you've probably got, especially with retailers, you've probably got a three to six month window. And if it's not really working, you know, you'll be in the next D list. So what are you going to do to make sure it sells out the store, not just into it? And again, so is it the right product for that channel? You know, there's no point having a mega pack in the convenience store or vice versa. You know, what are you going to do that's right for that consumer in that um, in that store? You know, have you got placement and displays? You're the right part of the shelf. What are you doing to be visible so that someone comes in and sees you? Again, I've said this a few times, but look, what's the experience and support, especially if we've got something technical, how's that going to be uh, delivered? Have you got the right promotion program? So, you know, often you get very strong uplifts from the promotion activity. You haven't got that. You won't get the rate of sale that people are looking for. And actually, that, that last point you mentioned, rate of sale, again, a return on investment. So if I'm going to give you that shelf space or I'm going to give you exclusivity, what does it look like, you know, for, for everybody. And actually, the additional point I just really wanted to make here, Simon, is that it needs to be a win, win, win. So what I mean by that is the consumer or end user needs to get a you know good deal and be comfortable with what they're getting and see value in it. The distributor or the retailer also needs to do it and you need to do it because if you're not getting that, everyone's, someone's going to lose interest pretty quickly. <laughs> And then you really haven't got the business. But if you can get this sort of thing going, you've got a, quite a good virtuous circle. So again, not rocket science, but just making sure that everybody's winning through because if someone in there could be the retailer, if they're not winning, they'll lose interest pretty quickly as well. Uh, the next uh, topic, and I know we're going through you know, relatively quickly, but uh, deliberate spelling of mom and pop in the American terms, because this goes back to a story I was told by a, Stanford professor, and it was about a drinks company selling to mom and pop stores or the American word for convenience stores. And he said, you know, it's really important whether it's mom or pop running it. And then he told a story that, right, well, the story was that it's often they were sort of just the only person in the store. And yeah, if you have, if the truck driver happened to turn up when mom was there running the store, she didn't order that much because she couldn't carry the crates. So she didn't order much. So when they figured that out and really looked to understand which stores are run by mum and which were by pop and actually figured out maybe let's have a driver that can actually carry the crates, the sales went through the roof. So look, so, so simple. Just who who is there and what's your user and just thinking about how you do that massive difference. So look, then, you know, what I wanted to talk about, and again, you know, each, you know, People that are watching this video or whatever will, will know their own business, but really spend some time to dig into who is your user or who is your customer. You know, that could be demographics and psychographics, so again, you know, age, et cetera, you know, how they're thinking, you know, what's their level of engagement? If you've got heavy users versus sort of light users, they're excited about your product or not. 
you know, kind of what's their kind of usage experience. And I'll share a story in a moment I had on this one. You know, where the location is, you know, what sort of influences are on them or influencers are looking at lifestyle, you know, what's a day in the life, you know, the level of usage I think I've already mentioned. So really look to understand your user because then what you can do is you can tailor your offer to meet those users. So I'm just going to run through again some simple examples to bring that to life. So that, that could be location. This is just something from a gym saying, right, we're targeting the guys in that area, come and get the deal. But, you know, it could be you could do it piece by location. Uh, this is a good New Zealand one. This is Super Gold Tuesdays at Fresh Choice. So essentially, you know, if you're an older age group, let's understand those guys and let's make an offer uh, to them. You know, potentially a bit more prevalent these days is uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie here is selling uh, meals for one. So again, if you know your user base, there is a bit of a, you know, a demographic that wants that offer in their single households, you know, bring it home and deliver something to them. Uh, influencers actually worked at the Whitakers for a while, and the, what was great was Nigella as a spokesperson really played back indulgence. So that was sort of a great example of you know, knowing you, you use a user group and, and having the right influencer. And then look, Costco, and the, they do a great job. And uh, I worked for Colgate for many years and we used to sell like a 10 pack toothbrush to Costco. That's really about heavy users, family groups, and what have you. So, really knowing that space and having the right offer uh, can make a difference. And this last story is a little bit of an interesting one. Uh, it's about user experience. So, I've got a detergent uh, bottle there because then I was uh, managing a brand that had a reasonably sized detergent bottle. We thought it'd be quite smart and take the handle off, uh, save a bit of plastic, good sustainability story, only to learn once we'd done that, that the users that had it, which were mostly female, couldn't lift it. So then the handle went back on. So, you know, just look, obviously just understanding exactly who your user group is can make a massive difference um, to, to, what, to what you're offering. So look, just thinking through Again, your user, what do they need? And you can really target the offers to make um, a massive difference. Uh, look, innovation is another key area of, of learning, and you really want to be innovating ahead uh, of the market wherever possible. And look, it is kind of there are some mantras on innovation here. And look, the first one is it is. You know, maybe not today, but tomorrow it's the lifeblood of your success. And again, you know, I shared the liquid hand soap foamy example earlier on, which is when I was involved with. And, you know, we had some activity from competitors that really had lost our advantage of the base product. But by innovating into foam, we really got the momentum back. And, you know, there's obviously the classic examples of BlackBerry, et cetera, that if you don't innovate, you know, someone can come and eat your lunch. So, look, you really need to be doing that as a, as a course of any business. I think it's important to keep closely connected to international trends. You know, if they're not here now, they're coming here and look, if you could be first to cab off the rank, uh, that can make a massive difference. So be aware, be connected, be looking to implement those here. Um, third point there is it talks about design thinking and if those haven't been exposed to that, that's sort of a process of iterative thinking and really looking to do that with feedback, to making something prototypes and getting feedback quickly with customers versus having the perfect thing can make a massive difference. And look, and there's some great new digital tools that make it incredibly cost-effective for even small businesses to get concept testing results. If you want to put up a concept with a new product and a price or whatever, you can do that stuff pretty cheaply now and even get sort of overnight results. So I think the idea of multinationals could do these incredible tests and understand and you know small businesses couldn't. I think that's really changing. So some great tools available there. Uh, the next point, you know, is something to think about is, you know, what can your business handle in terms of cadence of innovation and what's sort of required? So you might say, look, we can only do one big thing every two years and that works for us and works for our customers, but we're going to do some smaller repackaging or things between. But what does that shape of your innovation look like that you're comfortable with, you can cope with and resource? but also is going to make sense for the market. So look, really understanding that's key, as is the next point. So 
all innovation is not created equal. And again, clear example, you know, you might be look, chasing one thing and that's worth a million dollars and the next thing's worth 10. And so just working through what's the size opportunity and what's it going to do and, you know, hard hardness and ease, but be really clear about how you're going to prioritize. Everything's not created equal and you're know, chasing the right things when you've got limited resources and SME is incredibly important. But, you know, working through that, and that could be the, the basis of, again, the opportunity presents and how hard that is to achieve. And look, the, the last point that's really important, and I've sort of done this in many businesses I've, I've been involved in, is be comfortable to get rid of the low performers. Now, one of those products or services is everybody's favourite, you know, but it's tiny. And so just be comfortable to ditch it because the time and resource that's associated with that, you're more than gained by the innovation uh, that you're doing. And mostly you'll get those users back time and time again. I've seen that. So be comfortable to cut as well. So look, just some, this is a whole topic on its own, but just some key thoughts as you think about it. And it's really about sort of being connected and then thinking about what makes sense for yourself and then using some really neat tools that are available now to bring that to life. Uh, the next thing and pressing usually makes people pretty nervous, Simon. It's, uh, you know, not everyone's most sexy topic, but I think probably for both the top line and the bottom line, it's potentially one of the most important if you do it well, because it will play through both in terms of revenue and profitability. So look, you have to embrace it. You can't uh, shy away from it. So look, then you know, my sort of view is to think about pricing as an enabler. So you know, again, don't be scared about it, thinking about what it can do for you. So look, first point in that space is it's got to be clearly linked to your product service attributes. So and if you're going value, the price needs to be value. And if you're going premium and you want that quality, then look, the, the uh, classic story is if you want to sell a, um, you know, a um, $100 bottle of wine, you know, make sure there's a $120 bottle of wine on the on the, on the menu because people will be comfortable to go to the second price point. So, and, and that sort of fits with that, you know, shows sort of quality or whatever. So look, think about how it is uh, linked to a product or service. The second point, which maybe is an obvious, is sort of market back pricing. So I deal a lot with exporters, and the risk sometimes is you kind of put it on a boat, you know, with a with a sort of cost plus mentality. But you need to make sure that it's going to be successful in the market. So you need to make sure the landed price in the market is competitive versus your your benchmarks. And importantly, that everybody in that chain is going to make a reasonable margin. So the retailer or the distributor is going to make a reasonable margin at that price. And if you can't do that, it's not going to work, but really make sure you've got market back pricing because if you're not effectively landing in the market, you won't grow that business or make those sales. You can have pricing that's channel specific. So again, it could be a you know, big box store versus a premium outlet. You can do different sort of landed pricing. The best way to do that is to have slightly different packs or formats just to sort of differentiate that offer in the market, but you can do channel-specific pricing. Uh, I've made the point future-minded, and what I mean by that is you, we talked about channels earlier. You might start off with, you know, I want to go direct to consumer and I'm going to go just this, that's one of the sort of wholesale outlet or something. But if you then want to go to another channel that's more retail, you need to make sure you've baked in pricing and margin that will allow you to do that expansion. So just think about what's not just today, but tomorrow when you're doing your pricing. There's some great tools you can get customer feedback from, but again, you need to make sure that you're comfortable that that's going to hold up in the market. Uh, the next point I captured was multiple pricing levers. And I suppose all I would say is I think the sort of classic is I've got a pricing issue. I need to take my price up by you know, 50 cents or a dollar or $10 or $100, whatever you're doing. But I would just say there's so many more ways to take pricing. So you may do less or more promotion. You may change your mix to have more premium offers within your range and your, you know, price back to you will make a difference. There's lots of ways you can think about taking pricing that are quite smart and maybe won't have the same impact as potentially a kind of shelf price change for an individual product. So many ways to think about that. If you are taking those price point changes, just be mindful a little bit about the psychological price point. So again, I've seen that the yeah, classic is used to be $4 something and now it's five. Oh, I'm a bit nervous now. If it was already five and it's five and a bit, people are less worried. So just 
be mindful of that. And then, look, the last two points are about just keeping in touch with the market on pricing. So track how that's going, what are you doing, what are your competitors doing, what should you change, be really informed in the market. And, again, if you've got to make changes, make changes. They're easier down than they are up, but make changes. And then the other thing is, you know, be comfortable as a business that you make a regular review of your pricing sort of strategy and activity. And, you know, again, so at minimum, that's got to be annual. You've got to be saying, right, as we go into our next budget year or our next planning year, what are we doing on pricing? And you can make decisions not to make changes kind of fine, but you've got to go through that process because if you leave it for a, a number of times, and I've seen this from plenty of clients, if you leave it for, you know, it can be years. I haven't taken a price increase for a couple of years. And you've got to take a biggie. That's a hell of a lot harder. So, again, thinking about that regularly and making calls makes a lot of sense. So, again, I've gone through it quite quickly, but those are just some simple things about pricing. And, again, I think if you're thinking a bit front-footed with this, you're a hell of a lot better off. I think when you really get yourself caught is when you're forced into doing something you're uncomfortable with and then you're chasing it. So just try and get on that uh, on that front foot. Okay. That's sort of, I've run through the sort of, you know, some learnings and, and watch outs. What I also wanted to share today was just the sort of some thoughts on sort of, you know, um, activities and tools that can be used when sort of commercializing. And what I'll do is I'll go through those in sort of five areas. So, you know, sort of, brand strategy and I kind of see this as quite sequential you know developing the product or service based on the strategy but going to market deciding how you're going to go and then doing it and then sort of the ongoing sort of business management so sort of see those five areas as sort of key parts of, of commercialization and then look what I really wanted to sort of say is again because again having sort of experience and exposure I have I'm quite clear on sort of activities and tools you can use to sort of make that relatively simple. It's again, it's not rocket science, but just sort of having the experience, there's simple ways to kind of do these things. So again, in the business and brand strategy space, you know, there's some things you should be doing about, you know, sort of understanding what you, you know, clarifying what your business is really about, you know, what's happening in the market, you know, what are the competitors doing, you know, where do you want to, where do you want to be from a brand? And look again, we're talking about design thinking and there's some analytics you can do or sort of market scan work you can do. And, you know, obviously, and then even just, I think, getting feedback from key stakeholders, internal and external, can be incredible, power, incredibly powerful in that space. In the second area, again, you know, I've captured some key activities you can be thinking about there, but that's really about bringing your product or service to life. So, you know, who is who are you aiming at? You know, what are the key claims? How are you going to make it? how you should price it. And again, on the right-hand side, I've sort of captured this, you, know, you can do concept testing pretty easily now. You can get usage feedback and iterate. You know, you can be doing some competitive benchmarking or whatever. So again, some, some ways to be comfortable that your product or service is gonna hit the mark. And then when you've sort of got that in place, I suppose it's really about how am I gonna go? You know, where, who should I play with to bring that to life? And then, you know, right from, you know, which, which markets you're going to play in. So, again, I've done a bit of that work for a number of customers is to say, you know, which market and why and sort of what are the pros and cons. You know, it could be local or internationally, which distributor you want. And it's not the guy that you've at the bar. It's really going through a process that makes it, you know, be very clear about who's good in the market. Um, are they going to represent you well? Because especially in that sort of area, once you've made a call, it's really hard to unwind and they're essentially representing you in the market to do that well. You know, make sure you've got clear sort of marketing programs, et cetera. The one point I'll point out on the right, because again, it's not sexy, but it's important, is sort of the margin tree mapping. I think too often, um, this again is potentially a bit more exporting, but I think it probably happens local as well, is if you're not really clear about the sort of margins and costs of all the activity, you feel like you're making money and then you realise maybe you're not. So there's a few maybe not so obvious charges you might get through that chain. So just being very clear and mapping that out so you're very comfortable, you've sort of priced the right to be effective in the market and everybody's going to make money. So look, again, some, some, some thoughts there, but if I, you know, in this area, that really being clear on 
who's going to make money and, 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 and be comfortable that's going to be successful is important. Then look, then it's you need to bring it to life. So obviously you need to sell it into the to the to the to the partners in the in the channel of the market. And then look again, making sure that you've got uh, the right activity and then sort of just keep keeping on track of things really. So look at assessing how things are going, you know, for a profitability and, and and managing the accounts. And look, the last area today was just to say, right, you know, you need to kind of have um an ongoing sort of commercial business management uh, approach. And look, I'm quite a fan of a monthly business review. I think that sort of cycle works quite well for most businesses is really looking back on the the activity of the month and then deciding about how things should evolve. And then look, a key part of that's got to be making sure you keep really well connected with your partners. And I think especially, you know, sometimes that can be a bit difficult when they're overseas, but now with the technology with Zoom, et cetera, and then making sure you get into in markets is just really keeping up that regular performance so you get the focus that you need and if there's any issues, you can manage them quickly. A, a bit of a run through quite a lot of stuff uh, today, Simon, so hopefully not too quick. But look, really what I wanted to do was share some of my, you know, commercial lessons and, you know, hopefully, you know, share that with some of the audience today to help them. And then, look, I think just be comfortable that, Again, maybe you haven't the same, had the same exposure in this area, but look, there are some quite clear processes and tools. You know, someone like me can help, you know, you guide you through that, but there is sort of some clear processes and tools that can help you to success. And I think, if anything, they're becoming more accessible than, than they were before. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much, Pete. There's a huge amount there, but a really um, good practical stuff for um, business people to think about. I've only got a couple of basic questions, yeah. actually. I mean, one is, so, you know, we said at the start, you you, you, you know, you've got done some stuff with some big um, businesses and, and, and you now you do, you're doing a bit more of the SMEs. I mean, you've got an SME before you, it's a pet food company or it's yeah. a small hairdresser's chain or something or whatever it is. Um, where do you start with them? What's your sort of um, how, how does that work? Yeah, look, and I think look, part of that is really sort of understanding how their business is, is going so far. Yeah, mm -hmm. so look, really understanding sort of what's working and what's not. And look, it's, and then sort of being clear about what you, you, your service is and, and, and how that's sort of making sense. And then a little bit then, where, where do you want to go? I mean, what's the sort of vision uh, for the business thing, look, part of that, and I'm going to capture one of the slides, is getting that with sort of key stakeholders and being clear a little bit about, you know, what's our offer, where do we want to go, you know, sort of what sort of challenges do we see in the market and really doing some kind of assessment. And then I think then sort of aligning on some kind of game plan, you know, okay, we want to sort of, you know, grow in these areas. We want to think about product development. Do we want to be sharper in these spaces? And then and then actually then look to develop a specific plan for them. But I think, look, the start is kind of, you know, how is the business going? What are you about? You know, where do all the stakeholders want to, want to go? And I think, look, that sort of, again, you just do it much smaller, but that's sort of you need for bigger or smaller businesses just to be really clear about what you're, what you're about. And I think that, differentiation points really critical Simon so I think just sort of being really clear about you explain to me and we and the business should be able to explain to itself and its key stakeholders or employees or whatever this is what we're about and this is not what we're about and being really clear on that stuff and then where you want to go from there and I think what's quite interesting is that can shake a few things out it's to, to how clear you are on, on on what your offer is or not and then I think then building some, you know, again, you might want to say you want to grow in a specific area or a range or we see an opportunity to do that. And then, again, I could work with them on on sort of key steps to bring that to life. Yeah, I think, you know, um, a core concept here is is that differentiation. It's, I mean, I, I suppose it's just listening to you then. I mean, I think, you know, I was going to say, well, does a business need to differentiate? Look, it does. I mean, if it's that basic brand of toilet paper, for example, well, it's, it's going to have to differentiate and that's going to be on price. Yeah. You know, um, so there is, I, I take your point, there always has to be a differentiator. No, that's an, but, but it is conceiving that quite widely. It, it might, it's not no, it is. No, it is. the product, it's, it's the offering, it's where you're going with your marketing, it's who you're distributing through, et cetera. 
Yeah, 100%. And that's a really good point to make because it doesn't mean everybody should be the premium ultra X. You know, it should, it could really be about. Doesn't mean gold be... flakes in your um, cereal or, you know, whatever. It could, it could be the up, same. But... Yeah. No, but it could be to say, you like you say, look, I want to, I'm offering the widest range of X at the best price. And I'm, you know, I'm with yeah. it a phone call away if you've got any issues or whatever. Kind of what's you, where the best service, the best service. Or whatever. So it could be totally what it is. But I think that's going to give you a couple of things, Simon. I think it gives you that sort of control, which I kind of like is that idea of at least I'm a bit more in control of my destiny if I'm differentiated in some fashion. And you'll find then that people are stickier with you. You know, in a classic, actually, I um, I was in the UK in the 2008 financial crisis, and there's a brand there called Woolworths, not really here, but called Woolworths, and it was just a high street store, nothing differentiated, and it went out of business the next day. You know, whereas Waitrose, which was sort of a higher price or whatever kind of stayed because it was differentiated and they had a kind of specialised office. So I think just being clear about what it is, I think to your point, think about it broadly, but just be able to articulate that and then... The litmus test is, you know, does your customer group see that as valuable? You know, you, that's where you're hanging your hat on. Is it valuable? And, you know, and is it, you know, is it, is it sort of going to you know, be sustainable? Yes, no, absolutely. And I, I think sticking with that, I mean, word you use, which is a good word, um, and, you know, it's a basic one, but commercial, com being commercial and, um, and, and that differentiation point, and that commerciality that you're talking about, I mean, in a funny sort of way, maybe this is a bit of a random point to yeah. end on, but a lot of what you're um, you're talking about, it seems to me, is actually to be commercial, um, you, you need to have a kind of a deep empathy for those around you, whether it's the consumer or the, um, uh, the, 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 as you say, the retailer you're selling through, you know, so you are getting that to use your word win, win, win. And so, you know, um, uh, you know, actually, mum and dad have four kids, they need a 10 pack of um yeah. toothbrushes or um, you, you know, whatever it is in your things. That's that. So, so yeah, it seems to me that, that something that possibly businesses, certainly those that aren't successful, don't do enough is just really thinking deeply about you know what do they want it doesn't have to be the whole market but what is their segment of them are? and actually you know and it's not just them it's the it's, it's as you say it's your distributor it's your retailer it's your it's those those uh partners you have and because if if they're not into it you know you can have the best product but it's gone from the shelf within four weeks but 100 percent, i think good thing you've captured a, a great summary to be honest i would just say look you've got to spend the time empathizing with the, I think, probably two parts, empathizing with those parties and thinking about smart strategies that sort of bring that to life, you know, because again, then if you're very clear on what they're about, you can sort of tailor your product or your service to really bring that home to what they, what's valuable to them. And I think if you do that, to your point, right, I go to Costco and I get a, some big packs that really suit me, well, I don't want to get a value from that service. Or it could be at the other end, Look, I'm in town and I want a convenience product and the, gee, the chicken's got the, you know, the flavors or whatever. I can just take that home. I'm a star. Sort of what's, you know, what's your user group? And then if you can tailor the sort of offer or service to that, then again, people are going to sort of go with you. So I think just look, the, and then also the point I also just make it on that is, and if you've got to evolve it, evolve it. You know, what's always been successful maybe hasn't or you could be more successful. So be be comfortable to sort of you know reassess it and then maybe evolve it as well. Absolutely. Hey, well, as I say, some really good practical, helpful tips there, but but also you know um, on a big area uh, for for business around that that, that commercialisation of a of a product or offering. So we really appreciate Pete, and um, well, I'm sure we'll have your details up there. But you know, when people can get hold of you via email or whatever it is. Great, fabulous, Simon. Really appreciate your time today. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Right, thank you.